Okay, guys, we are live. This is podcast number five or six. I can't remember right now. I'm here with the one and only Greg Borger. Greg is my partner in Shield K9 Ottawa. But it also turns out that Greg's a pretty interesting guy. <laughs> when I first met Greg, um, I met him in the context of him being a client, and he can get into that story because it's an interesting story. Um, but I, always, I, I just thought that Greg was a guy that, that he had like some kind of landscaping business or something like that. So I was like, okay, you know, business dude, you know. Um, but it turns out that Greg has a, a, a bit of an interesting career. He was hiding things from me. I didn't know that uh, Greg actually uh, was doing a lot of other things too. So it's always nice to find things out at the last minute. But Greg, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. <clears throat> Thank you, and I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here and uh, super excited about our uh, partnership uh, and being able to grow uh, Shield K9 uh, Ottawa. Uh, fantastic, uh, obvious company, and it's something that uh, Ottawa uh, really needed. So, um, like has said, uh, the way we kind of met was uh, we needed help with one of our dogs, where no one uh, in Ottawa could uh, help and we were literally at uh, wit's end. Um, uh, Halo is the dog, and uh, he was uh, going to be euthanized. So, you actually had the appointment set up. Yes. Like yes. time, date, yeah. everything. Yeah. Like we had, a, we had a date of death planned. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So to give you a bit of background is uh, I and my wife, we've always had uh, working line German Shepherds. Um, We've had um, four, so we had um, Trigger, Tika, Luna, and Brewster. And uh, I mean, these weren't pedigree breeds. We, we actually lucked out. Uh, Trigger we got from a breeder. The other ones were rescued German Shepherds um, mm -hmm. and um, no issues with them. Um, great dogs, uh, typical German Shepherd personality, uh, all off-leash trained, uh, trained through a school. Uh, in Ottawa that was very much only one methodology of training and that was positive reinforcement and, and uh, you know, not the sort of new way of training. Um, and uh, two years ago, uh, well now it would be three actually, uh, I was uh, wanting to get into dog sport and did my research on dogs, um, you know, uh, Malinois, Dutch Shepherd, um, and new as best as I could, uh, what it meant bringing in one of those breeds in terms of the level of engagement, mental stimulation, exercise required, and as well as uh, making sure that the proper training was put on. So we ended up getting a Halo as a puppy um, from a, a local breeder. And, you know, I look back at it now and the big mistake uh, I made was not ensuring uh, good genetics or good breeding. Turns out uh, Halo uh, had sketchy genetics. And uh, as he matured and as he grew, and I mean, he was still a puppy, his level of reactivity uh, to everything uh, from um, people, cars, strangers was unbelievable, like something that I've never seen or experienced before. And it got to the point where my wife was not comfortable walking with him. I mean, obviously, you know, when, when my wife would walk him, she'd feel stressed, the dog would feel that energy, and then you know, it would just amp up the, the situation and everything else like that. So when it comes to uh, trying to, to fix the, the issues, I mean, every, my understanding and the, the level of training that I had at the time uh, wasn't working. So we reached out to uh, multiple trainers and sources in Ottawa and uh, we went as far as Montreal uh, to uh, see a, the so-called uh, specialist uh, trainer um, who wouldn't even handle Halo, <laughs> didn't even want to uh, hold the leash or touch him. Mm -hmm. um, the local ones that we reached out to at the time, we heard everything from put him on medication to uh, um, uh, get him fixed because we were going to wait till he was 18, 24 months before we got him fixed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, none of which made sense to us and you know looking at uh, his level of reactivity and and we're my wife and i are believers that like any dog should complement your life not sure. make your life terrible yes 
Um, and the reality is, is uh, we, we, we didn't see a, a prospect of rehoming. Like I wasn't going to just say, uh, hi, Humane Society, here's this great dog and we can't handle him and kind of pawn the problem off on someone else. Well, they would put him down. Uh, probably, probably. 100% they would put him down. Um, and, and the fact that we couldn't find anyone that would help us with his training, uh, we made the tough decision and I, I, it's kind of funny, I remember it, it was a, uh, a Friday, my wife and I kind of looked at each other and said, okay, we're, you know, we're going to have to put him down and we made the appointment for the following Monday. Uh, and it was hard for us, I mean, like, we're realistic about dogs, but I've never really given up on a dog and to me it was kind of personal, like, how is it that I can't solve this problem, like, like why can't I make this work? Um, and I mean, this may sound corny, but I was on um, uh, one of a uh, working Dutch Shepherd's Facebook page on a Saturday, and your video of you walking your two dogs through, I think it was Banff National Park. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Where you should, when you talk about reactive dogs and everything else like that. So right away after seeing that video, of course, found your website and, uh, you know, look at my wife and I'm like, well, here's this, maybe this is something that can help. Um, sent an email uh, Saturday to you guys. Uh, following Sunday, Stephen responded to the email. And in our email, we were very uh, detailed in terms of our background, our understanding of the dog, mm -hmm. um, the particular problems uh, of um, Halo. And I remember Stephen basically responding and saying, uh, um, yeah, we can absolutely help. We see this all the time. Looks like just basic fear reactivity, no problem. Yep. And we were kind of like, Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Like, like, I don't know if I necessarily trust that right off by the email. We're not right? giving you the third degree. No, no, you're not, right? <laughs> We're like, yeah, we can fix it. Bring them down. <laughs> um, so then uh, what we did is we looked at the Google reviews. And at the time, there was like 250 Google reviews. Uh, and all of them, or not all of them, but most of them were kind of our story. We were at our wit's end. We didn't know what to do. We were going to put the dog down, and they fixed it. So... Uh, we actually made an appointment uh, to come down a couple of weeks later because I wanted, you know, Shield Canine to actually see this dog to make sure that, you know, it, it, this wasn't over, over your head, which sure, obviously yeah. it wasn't. And I remember driving down and, uh, with my wife, and it was uh, Stephen and uh, it was your brother, Sal, that, Sal, that yep. came out uh, to take a look at Halo. And, of course... Um, Halo is acting like an asshole on his pinch collar, pulling, lunging, barking, doing all this crazy stuff. And I remember Sal just kind of standing there and hard st staring Halo for a while. And then after about 30 seconds, H Halo's demeanor changed. And he, he stopped reacting as much and started to back away and actually move behind me. And yeah. I remember Sal saying, no, no, that's, that's, that's fear reactivity. Now he doesn't know what to do because normally when he would act like an asshole, mom and dad would take the dog away or the, the person would move away. And then he looks at me, he goes, hand me the leash. And I'm like, you're crazy, man. You're going to get bit. Like, where's the, <laughs> where's the liability for him? And he, and he took the leash and he gave it a leash pop and he walked off with Halo and nothing happened. And we were like, wow, you know, like that, that's just amazing. So we signed him up for a six week board and train. He came down here. Um, and picked him up and you know what we have now is we have a dog that um, needs to be managed for sure but I mean there's a video of me and him walking through busy farmers market people brushing up against him and he's not reacting right Perfect. Um, a dog that we can you know love and live with mm -hmm. and um, yeah you guys made all the difference well you know what? I'll say this. Halo wasn't, he wasn't notable for us. Yeah. I, he's notable for you because he's yeah. your dog. But for us, it's like, yeah, it's just another reactive dog. Like there's some dogs you get in that are like, you know, the dog from hell. But like Halo wasn't that bad. Like he was like your typical kind of reactive, aggressive dog. He could certainly work his way into trying to bite somebody, but it wasn't his first go-to. It was certainly a, a primarily fear-motivated behavior. But for sure, it's an intimidating display. And, um, you know, definitely if you did the wrong thing, you'd get bit, um, but you have to know what to do with the right thing. But uh, it's interesting. There's so many trainers, and I put this in quotations, that claim to be able to fix these dogs and help these dogs. And it's like, 
you know, a dog like Halo for them, it's like their Waterloo, you know, it's like, it's like, oh man, you know, this is all full, everybody wear the hazmat gear and, you know, batten down the hatches and everybody gets scared and, and, and get worried. And for us, it's just another day, you know, yeah. with, those, with those types of dogs. So um, for those that don't know, Ottawa is actually very far from where we are. It's about a five hour, six hour drive. Yep. So for you to come down just for an assessment for, I mean, I guess when, when we're putting that up against the idea that we're going to put the dog down, if this doesn't work out, it would make sense, but it's still quite a time investment to drive all the way down here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for, for us, I mean, you know, our, our, our dogs are our family, right? I mean, they're not just, um, you know, creatures. Um, so, you know, when we're going to make that uh, decision that, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to euthanize this animal because we have exhausted every last check in the box, uh, you know, coming down here for a day to, to again, have that peace of mind it was important to us, right? Because the last thing you want to do is kind of sit there and go, what if? What, what if you had, there was something to be done? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, I want to make something too clear. Like when we talk about management, a lot of people think, so obviously management means that you're managing the dog in relation to his or her surroundings, his or her environment, his or her social interactions. A lot of people think that means putting the dog in a bubble and isolating the dog forever. And that's for sure an example of management, but that's not good management. With good training, you are able to implement a management system that actually makes sense. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is that Management doesn't mean, like I said, this heavy form of isolation and the dog's always muzzled and all this kind of nonsense. Your dog doesn't walk around with a muzzle on. Um, you know, your dog, like you said, is able to go off leash in public areas. But on the flip side, when we're talking about management, yeah, strange people shouldn't be touching your dog. Yep, exactly. You know, visitors to your house, he shouldn't be meeting them at the door. He's on his bed. He's waiting there on his bed, you know, like common sense kind of stuff that obviously it's not for us. It's common sense because we understand how the dogs think, learn, communicate and why they do what they do. But I think a lot of people are very confused about that. So when we say management, a lot of people envision this very limited life, which a lot of dogs, unfortunately, are forced to live because there isn't that training out there that is available to the vast majority of people to like get them that control that they need in order to be able to live a basic life with the dog. For me. If you've got to lock your dog up 24-7, walk your dog with a muzzle, and keep your dog on a six-foot tether for his entire life, it, it, I hate to say it, you almost might as well put him down. That's, that's such a terrible life. Like, he's pretty much in prison, you know. You know, I 100% agree, right? And, and, I mean, to your point, you know, if, if, if we could go back and somebody said to me, <clears throat> you know, the day before we were going to get Halo, this is the way he's going to be, yeah, I probably would have been a hard pass, right? For sure. <laughs> because, again, <clears throat> there is that management, to your point, right? When he's loose to the house, um, somebody comes to the door, you got to be like, hey, low place. He goes mm -hmm. to his place bed, open the door, right? You can't just arbitrarily do it. And, you know, we have friends that come over that um, Halo is fine being on a place bed and then I can free him and he goes around them because those friends understand and know don't try to reach out and yep. get him and yet they're you know and then there are those people that come over that we know they're not going to understand the way Halo is yep. well, we're going to put Halo in the bedroom yep for a little time out because we don't trust not him we don't for trust sure. our friends <laughs> hey when my son's friends come over my dog my dog goes away he's he's a naturally reactive dog as well and I know those kids are going to do some crazy stuff around him. I'm not even going to set him up for it. I'm not going to stress about it. He can go in his crate. He's crate trained. He can yeah. go in, you know, he can go in the dog room. He's fine, you know, and, and people need to get comfortable doing that. I feel like a lot of people, they're either all in or they're all out. And it's like, no, just have that presence of mind. Like I find like so many owners, you know, they either overdo it or they completely underdo it. Like they have zero awareness of what their dog is doing. Like when I'm out with my dog, I know what he's doing. Yep. I might be talking to you. I might be drinking a coffee. I might be looking at my phone, but I also know what my dog's doing. It's no, no great surprise to me if my dog is like approaching somebody. Like I know he's doing that and I'm preventing all of these things from happening. So management is like, it's, 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 a, situ it's a form of situational awareness. Yep. 
And that's what drives me nuts about dog parks and why I'll never go to a dog park is people will go to dog parks with their dog and it's like, I'm just going to let these dogs run carte blanche yep. with zero awareness, right? It's like saying I'm going to bring oh, my... Oh, no, something happened. Well, exactly. <laughs> like bringing your, your toddler to a mall and letting your, your toddler run free with the mall and no care in the world. Like, you would never do that. So yes. yeah, you're going to take your dog that may not get along with another dog or gets amped up over a stick or something else and uh, hope for the best, right? Oh, that's, There's that's, a lot of hope at dog parks, and sometimes the hopes don't work out. Yeah, like one of my yeah. favorite things, like like when I walk Halo, he is always off leash, right? For sure. So um, I have a leash with me in case Bylaw or somebody comes around. Um, he's out, he's smelling, he's doing his thing. You know, when I see people coming, I just ask him to be with me. He comes to me just to make people feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we'll get into the open area fields and I always laugh is like he'll be running around and there'll be somebody with uh, a dog um, that starts running towards him, right? And I'm like, Halo with me, gets beside me again. And, you know, the person's like, he's friendly, don't worry, don't worry. And I'm like, He's not, <laughs> and then watch them lose their mind, calling their dog back that's not coming, and then yeah. I just step in front, and yeah, Halo block. lays there, and, and uh, you know, I got you, Halo, I'll take yeah. care of this, right? And it just, you know, and then, then they'll turn around and give you shit. Well, you shouldn't bring an unfriendly dog to a dog park. <laughs> it's like, this isn't a dog my park. Dog, my dog's laying there, and <laughs> your dog's acting like an asshole. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, you know, and a lot of people ask me, too, like, a lot of people are like, what about the leash laws? You know, because they haven't been living the off-leash life. Like, I lived the off-leash life now for, I don't know, a decade. Uh, and everywhere you go, for sure, it's the law. Your dog should be on a leash, except in very specific areas. Um, and yet my dogs are never on the leash, and I've never once gotten a ticket. You know why? Because my dog is under control. The, the Most of the time, and I've passed many bylaw officers and police officers, yeah. guess where my dog is? Yep. Right next to me. They couldn't even tell he doesn't have a leash on because he's right next to me. And if you want, you can put a tab Put a little tab on your dog. There's no law that says how long the leash has yeah. to be. You pick up your tab and now yeah. you're uh, yeah. legal. But they don't bother you if your dog is under control. Well, so yeah. it's yeah. a funny story. There's a neighbor that lives down the street from us, um, has a German Shepherd that's reactive and um, uh, you would walk the dog and he would always have to have the dog basically tight on the leash because the dog loses shit, everything else like that. And I started to walk um, Halo past his house. And of course, Halo is always with me and, and everything else. And he um, at one point confronts me saying, your dog really should be on a leash. And I'm like, thank you, but he's good. And I continued walking. And a couple of days later, I'm walking him again. And he, he's out there with his wife. And uh, he pulls out his uh, phone. And he goes, your dog needs to be on a leash and, and everything else. And he's filming me. So I ended up doing a bunch of obedience with Halo down, walked oh, away. Oh, you made a little spin. show? I did a, I did a, whole, <laughs> I, I did a whole show. And I'm like, uh, I just wanted to make sure that you had enough uh, footage proof for bylaw that <laughs> yeah. he was off leash here, right? And um, yeah. And, I guess he uh, didn't submit that video. He didn't submit the video. I, I did have bylaw come to the door and, and remind me that all dogs have to be on leash. Of course, sir. Yeah, yeah, of course. Else. Yeah. <laughs> but th that, I mean, that's the problem, right? Is, is it, it takes one person, you know, that if they want to. There's always one. Right? The letter of the law versus the spirit of the you law. You know what I find and, those people are? They're all jealous. Yes. Instead of saying, holy camoly, Greg, how did you get your dog to do that? I would like my dog to do that. Yeah. They say, you know what? Screw you, Greg. Screw you and all that obedience you've got. You know, yeah. let me try and wreck your day because every time I walk my dog, it's an unpleasant experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hey, misery loves company. And there's always a few of those, you know, and uh, I deal with them as is appropriate. But yeah. uh, it's, it's generally not much of a problem. And there's no other... There's no better life to live than the, I don't, I don't even have leashes with me half the time. Like, you know, my wife will be like, okay, well, I think here you should put a leash on. And I'll be like, I don't even think I have one. <laughs> I like looking through the, I'm like looking around, like checking my, checking my car. Cause I, half the time I don't even have a leash cause I just, you don't need them. Right. Yeah. But, um, it's funny. So anyways, uh, you bring us Halo getting back to the story. Uh, did you end up fixing him, by the way? I can't remember if you fixed him uh, before you brought him to us. No, no. So he was, uh, he would have been intact because we did wait the, the point of uh, like 18, 20 months. So you brought him to us at what age? Uh, he was just a year. A year old. Yeah. So yeah, that's usually when they start kind of hitting their peak reactivity there because yeah. the, all the hormones are, are kicking in and yeah. all the, uh, uh, the, mental, the mental maturity. You know, a lot of people make the mistake. They see a puppy... And they say, this puppy that as he is here at eight weeks is going to be like this forever. 
and uh, it's not. There's a lot of dormant genetic traits, sociability, environmental stability, uh, drives, all of these types of things that are going to kick on as the dog matures. And a lot of people, you know, assume that the, the puppy that they see in the beginning is the puppy they will have forever. And for sure, there are some traits that you can see there that are kind of a signal of what is to come. But nothing, there's many things in there that, um, there's, there's, there's many uh, behavior traits in the dog as a puppy that are still loading, so to speak. Yeah. And, and there's no set time when they kick on, but usually we see uh, a lot of reactive dogs between 10 and 14 months. That's like the primary age when it just reaches that peak where it's like, okay, we can't do this anymore. It's horrific, you know, because usually then the behavior's kind of reached its pinnacle. So you didn't, uh, a lot of people get that advice to fix the dog. So you didn't fix the dog. No, no. Yeah. And that's one thing I'm, I'm going to say it here on this podcast. Absolute nonsense. No. Fixing and a dog will not fix your behavioral problems. I think the idea comes from um, the horse world. Or, or, you know, like cows, like cattle, right? Like if it's a bull, it's going to be a problem. If it's a stallion, it's going to be a problem. Cut the nuts off of it. Get rid of the testosterone. You're not going to have a problem anymore. Um, for whatever reason, it just doesn't work like that with dogs. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's, it's one thing for, again, like say a trainer to make that recommendation. What we did is we actually called our vet who we, we trust and he's a, he's a great guy. And we said, this is the advice that's been given to us. What do you think? And he said, no, he goes... Um, you know, fixing a dog at that age could help temper if it was like sexual or aggression in the dog. But sure. if you're talking about temperament, it's not going to do anything, right? So we were I'm like, surprised okay. you got that advice. He is a good vet. Yeah. You want to yeah. shout him out? Yeah. Uh, well, it's Andrew Sperling from the Osgood Vet Center. I don't think he's there anymore. He's on sabbatical or oh, thing, okay. but he did, uh, like he gave us, he gave us that advice. And uh, I mean, even with medication, right? Like we talked to him about medicating the dog and like he said, you know, it can certainly work because all it's going to do is it's going to take the, the dog and sedate him. And lobotomize them basically thing with, with, the, with animals. It's not like human where you can't say, well, how does this feel? Right. So yeah. there's a lot of trial and error in terms of finding the right dose. Right. Well, it's interesting because we get a lot of dogs in like your dog that are on the medication. The first thing we do is we remove all the medication. Yeah. We just want to deal with what the dog is genetically and then work with that. You know, a lot of people, and the reason they're here is because the medication, quite frankly, yeah. it didn't work. They yeah. say, ah, oh, maybe it's a bit better, but it doesn't really work. You know, and I think if you're using it in a high enough dose that it is going to work, it's, you're basically lobotomizing the dog. You've got like a, a zombie at that point. And that's what drives me nuts about some of the rescues out there, right? Is they'll take these, these dogs that see other people don't want or pod cakes or reactive dogs. They put them on a bunch of medication and then people are like, oh, look at this calm dog. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and then they get them home and then they take them off the, the meds and now they're dealing with this, you know, Tasmanian devil. And they're That's like, right. this dog wasn't like this at the rescue. Why well, you took him off tramadol? <laughs> you know what? I want to jump back to uh, something your vet said, and that's very true. And, and you know, we talk about, we talk, I, I, I mentioned briefly like cattle and horses. If you think about all the behavioral problems that a stallion or a bull may, uh, challenges, I should say, may offer you. I, I got to say, I've never really thought of all the problems that a, a stallion I have a stallion. Bull. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly, uh, you, you know, the, the, the sexual hormone, the testosterone that's inside of him certainly makes him more active and pushy than, uh, I guess, a gelding would typically be. Um, and then for a bull, but... For a bullet, I guess it's the same, and they they have more aggression because that sexual the, the 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 testosterone inside of them certainly promotes that behavior. But for whatever reason, with dogs, because I think most bad behavior is motivated by fear and insecurity. Uh, obviously, cutting the uh, testosterone off, the testosterone production in a dog off, it's not going to change uh, the level of fear and insecurity. If anything, it actually makes it worse because if you look at the literature on fixing dogs, and there is literature available now, not only does um, early neuter make it more likely that uh, physical problems are going to occur in the dog as he or she ages, which is a no-brainer if you really understand, you know, how the human body or, or animals physically develop over time. Um, what also happens is uh, they actually end up having more behavioral issues. Yeah. Because it, it turns out that those hormones are actually kind of important to both their mental and physical development. So I'm, I'm a really staunchly against early neuter 
uh, early spay of any dog. I think it's uh, I think the, the the negatives far outweigh any potential benefits. But people are are scared into doing it. Oh, your dog's going to get cancer. Your dog's gonna... it's like listen, dogs, animals have existed for thousands and thousands of years without having their uh, sexual organs forcibly removed, and it does not. Uh, negatively impact their lifespan. You know, of course, there's some instances in which a, a cancer may occur or may not occur, but the damage that can be done, especially by early removal of sexual organs that produce, uh, you know, necessary hormones to the physical and mental development of a dog are far outweighed by any benefits. Yeah. So, you know, I'm glad you guys didn't fix them. You did fix them now though, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 But he's already fully developed. Yeah. Yeah. Which is... By the way, with my stallion, I'm going to do the same. You know, <laughs> when I'm sure he's fully physically developed, yeah, he doesn't need those anymore. I'll, I'll take them off. But um, at this time, you know, any kind of be, and it's funny, you know, with horses, it's the same thing. So like, I have a stallion, so I'm looking around for trainers to help me with the horse, and everybody, oh, stallion, ah. I'm like, okay, I don't need to deal with anybody that's scared of a stallion. If you're scared of a stallion, you really actually don't know what you're doing from a horse training perspective. I figured it's the same, it works the same yeah. as with dogs because you know how many dog trainers and dog kennels will say if it's intact, they won't deal with it, you know, it's, which is crazy to me. It's wild. It's the same thing. I finally found a few trainers that were not intimidated by the fact that the horse was a stallion and they had no problem training the horse and teaching him to behave around other horses and so on and so forth. I don't have to keep him in like this state of like isolation and, you know, lockdown. Like he's good around other horses. He's good in, you know, uh, stables. He's, he's good in the backyard. My kids can go in there with him. He's not a problem. But, you know, that's because we found some trainers that are comfortable with an intact horse and they're not intimidated by what nature gave him. And I think if, as a dog trainer, horse trainer, whatever trainer you are, if you're intimidated by something that nature is naturally giving the animal, if you have to cut something off the animal in order to be able to effectively work with that animal, you're no kind of trainer I want to deal with. Interesting. Yeah. So, you left Halo with us, and then you came back, picked him up. How did it go? Uh, great. I mean, yeah. you know, like, again, it comes down to... Yep. And consistency and more consistency, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and, and like we were warned and like I know now is, you know, at the beginning he decided to test nothing crazy or anything else like that. For sure. Uh, but we made it very clear to him in terms of what uh, was acceptable, not acceptable. And like I said, mm -hmm. now we have a dog that... Uh, uh, both myself and obviously my wife are totally comfortable bringing into public, yeah. having people over and, and everything else, right? And he, fi he fits in. Uh, you know, again, I mean, if, if I had to do it all over again, I'd pass. But, I mean, we have a dog now that, I mean, is part of the family. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, some people struggle with this idea of consistency. You know, like they, even though we'll explain to them, like, look, it's not a robot. We're not going to program it and send it back to you and you don't have to do anything on your end. You have to maintain the same, you know, behavioral management and training management that was implemented here. You have to be doing the same things at home and we'll show you how to do it, but you got to do it. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that are able to do it like you are. And then there are some people, unfortunately, that no matter how many times you tell them, they just, they cannot be consistent. They are incapable of consistency and of course, the dog's the one that suffers because the dogs with that have a nice, easygoing temperament, your neighbor's Labrador retriever or, la, you know, whatever, it's like, yeah, you can get away with being inconsistent with him because he's just easy. At, at worst, he'll be a little bit excited and jump on people. Yep. Uh, but when you have a dog that, you know, has that fear aggression, you know, somebody can get hurt. You know, the, dog can, the dog can do something regrettable. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not being consistent. So the, the, the price for a lack of consistency with some dogs, you pay a significantly higher price, obviously. Yep. And, I mean, I think the big thing, I mean, getting into Shield Canine Ottawa is, is it's more about uh, training the owners than it is about training the dog, right? Because um, a lot of people will go into buying a dog without understanding what's required. What do you mean I have yeah. to walk this dog? Right? What, no. what, what, what do you mean? I, I didn't think that. This dog needs how much exercise? This dog needs mental engagement. This dog needs, right? It's, you know, again, it's like you, you're into an, an aquarium and fish. Like, what do you mean? I got to clean the tank, right? It's like every week, are, baby. <laughs> those are things you just yeah. need to do, right? And then people will, will, 
will get a breed that looks cool on TV, right? Like, you know, when I, you watch movies like, uh, or series like Seal Team or anything else with yeah. mouths, right? Or like how many, you, you, you guys probably see it all the time, right? Uh, you know, with people like, uh, you know, I got this mouth and I saw it on Seal Team and it, 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 <laughs> and it did nothing, right? You wanted the Navy <laughs> Seal dog, did you? <laughs> exactly, right? So, you know, people will jump into these things without really thinking about the consequences, right? That's right. No, absolutely. So let's, let's, let's get back to uh, us now. How did you go from being a client with a reactive dog to then um, deciding that you wanted to partner with us? So my uh, background is uh, uh, recently retired from policing. I finished 31 years uh, policing. I started uh, policing in uh, London, Ontario. Mm -hmm. Spent uh, some time there and then uh, moved back home uh, to Ottawa uh, for the majority of my career. Finished it um, uh, there. Um, and I've uh, always tinkered with businesses. I, 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 to what you said, I had a landscaping business as well as another uh, business for uh, pedestals, rooftop applications. And I'm always kind of looking for new ideas or things that interest me and everything else. You're an entrepreneur. I, I don't know if I'd call myself that. I mean, I, I think I'm more somebody that needs to always be busy and always doing something that I like to do. I mean, yep. to me, it's not about being a millionaire or making the money. It's about making some money, but yet, uh, you know, getting up and enjoying what you do, right? I mm -hmm. mean, I've, I've, I can say this about policing. I can say this about my businesses. There's, you know, sure, there's going to be a day you wake up and you're like, I really don't feel like doing this, but it's not like I really don't like what I'm doing, right? And I think that that's, that's key for somebody being happy, right? Um, so I just looked at two factors, our experiences with, with, with Halo, and I thought, I can't be the only one um, that has this type of dog. And then coming out of the pandemic, uh, seeing the amount of you know, pandemic dogs and dogs that were uh, adopted for the, you know, the, the comfort and uh, having somebody at home with you, but yep. not being exposed to people, not being exposed to normal life, the, the level of reactivity is just through the roof now, right? For sure. So a, li a light bulb did go off in terms of, uh, okay, like how do we bring this to Ottawa? Like how do we, like Ottawa needs this, you know, nation's capital, a million people. We need this level of, 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 of training where a, a simple process, a simple training methodology can accomplish uh, you having a good life with your, with your dog, right? Um, and my wife and I, we've always been into, uh, well, dogs and we've always said like, you know, when we retire, wouldn't it be cool to, you know, run a dog business or have a kennel or something like that. And it was actually, it's, it's kind of funny. It was almost a year ago now, cause we were in Mexico last year in November this time where, uh, a friend sent me a message of a kennel, Beds for Tails. Uh, being up for sale in Ottawa and my wife and I kind of looked at each other and like oh wouldn't this be cool ha 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 and then we just started talking about it right and <clears throat> we started to uh, look at going down the path for purchasing that which we ended up doing and part of that was how do we incorporate a training business right uh, we it was just a boarding business to be clear it was just yeah so it's beds for tails kennels is the it was a boarding business and that's the um, the boarding side the kennel side of the business right now. So what we've done is we, we basically have two businesses. We have Beds for Tails Kennels and then Shield Canine Ottawa. So <clears throat> when we looked at the, the training aspect of it, we were like, okay, so do we spin up our own business, right? Do we, do we start from the ground up? And, um, you know, then it was like, well, why don't I reach out to Haz and see if he would be interested? And I mean, I've heard you on social media, you know, kind of joke around about how everybody's hitting you up to expand the business and everything else. And I'm like, well, you know what? The only thing you can do is tell me to pound salt, but I'm going to reach out to them, right? I mean, my kind of thoughts behind that is like, I may be a great barista, but if I open up Greg's coffee shop and Tim Hortons opens up across the street, the lineup for Tim Hortons is going to be much longer than Greg Barista, right? So, you know, taking advantage of the, the Shield uh, canine brand and everything else. So I reached out to you and you seemed interested and, uh, you know, we spent uh, a yeah. better part of a year kind of figuring, figuring it, out. it out, putting in, and now we're, we're spinning up and getting going. Well, you had a plan. Okay. You were a former client. Um, 
And uh, there were a number of other factors that we're not going to get into now that, uh, you know, certainly made me say yes when normally I say no. Because for me, maintaining the quality of what we do is super important. I'm not just expanding for expansion's sake. I'm not one of these companies that's going to run like a, you know, a two-week franchise school and now you're, you're a dog trainer. Like I know there's a bunch of them that do that. I'm not one. Um, for me, it's, I've learned it's, it's, it's quality over quantity both with the training and with the expansion and so, so on and so forth. So, but what you, you proposed, you're a smart guy, you're a details guy, and obviously now knowing your history, it makes sense. Um, but like you, you came at me with a very reasonable boom, boom, boom proposal. And of course, the Ottawa market is. The Ottawa, Montreal, all, you're, that area that you're in, there's, there's like nobody there. It's very underserviced. Um, and uh, it made a lot of sense. And uh, you made a lot of sense. So that's why we decided to move forward. But, um, you know, I guess you can take this as a lesson in general business. If you want to hit somebody up and, you know, say that you want to do business with them, come with a plan, bring value, bring, you know, present them with, with stuff that makes sense. And if you present them with stuff that makes sense where there's value in it for them and value in it for you, I think that that's how business is done. Yep, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So... You bought the kennel beds, beds for tails. Now you have Shield Canine Ottawa there, and uh, you're expanding the facilities. We did a whole video, guys, yep. on YouTube. If you want to see it, you can see the uh, the facility. We we filmed all the facility. You can see, you know, we we went and did a pet expo together. Um, yeah, we had a good time, and you guys can see, you know, Shield Canine Ottawa and all the things that it offers. But um, I want to talk a little more more about Greg. So. In terms of who's training at Shield Canine Ottawa, who is training there? Because is, is it you? Well, I will have the opportunity to uh, help out with training, but again, that's not going to be my uh, key role. I mean, with regards to me training, I, I'm a big believer in um, kind of put up or shut up, right? I mean, I'm not going to call myself a dog trainer when I'm not a dog trainer. So the mm -hmm. one thing that I am doing right now is going through your trainer's course in order to get that certification. And then once I have that, then being able to participate in the training. But I mean, my focus as an owner is gonna be very much on the operation of the day-to-day -day businesses and obviously have the ability to train dogs because I do enjoy it. Right? Yeah, we're more than a training methodology and like that's the big thing, you know, when you wanna run a successful dog training business, it's more than just, can you train dogs? You know, like there's a lot of people out there that can train dogs, but they can't run a business because they don't know how to deal with clients. They don't know how to, you know, manage uh, scaling a business. They don't know how to manage facilities. They don't invest in their facilities. I see a lot of dog trainers, you know, um, they made good money training dogs, but they never invested in their business. They never invested in their facilities. You know, the dogs are never living in, in the most ideal circumstances. They don't have nice training, uh, a nice training center or anything like this. And I'm a big believer facilities that's the home of your business that's the foundation of your business if you have a nice facility you know um, and then you pair that with a good uh, ability from a training perspective you're off to the races but a lot of trainers I feel you know kind of fail in that in that sense where they're either good only on one side or the other um, and there's very few people that are, are marrying good training to good facilities so yeah, yeah. and yeah. I mean we got lucky with the, the beds for tails it's a, a great facility uh, we're doing a lot to improve it. Um, this week, uh, all our fencing uh, starts. So yep. they figure it'll be one to two weeks uh, before that's completed. It's uh, 1,500 linear feet of uh, fencing mm -hmm. with um, sort of airlocks for the dog safety and everything else. And um, I mean, once that's up, it's going to uh, greatly uh, help enhance, uh, you know, the, the dog's uh, ability to, to play as well as to train, right? I'm excited to see your uh, indoor facility when you do it because I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. our plan this winter is to start uh, knocking down. There's a bunch of trees and everything else in there to prep that area and then mm -hmm. um, unfortunately start to jump through the whole uh, permit process hoops and everything else. So, I mean, I'm not even sure how long that's going to take, but it'll take as long as it takes and then we'll, we'll get a good facility yeah. in there to uh, be able to service the market, right? I mean, I look at your facility and... You know, it's like, it's like perfect. Yeah, well, it's a marathon. It's not a, it's not a sprint, sprint, you know? Yeah. And uh, the, the people that uh, just keep going, one foot in front of the other, you know, building their skills, 
building their facilities, building their business, that's, that's the key to success in my opinion. Yeah, so I mean, th th we obviously have the ability to do all the training outdoors and uh, we have access to a, a three car garage that we are converting, um, insulating, heating, Mm -hmm. um, to do uh, any private lessons or training during the really bad weather months, right? Never oh, been. Ottawa gets horrific. Ottawa, the weather is, is yeah. it's not nice. So in the meantime, they have the plan. Obviously, you guys have plans um, until that, that facility is done. Um, but I want to I jump back to, uh, to something because we're, we're jumping all over the place as most organic conversations go. You uh, were a police officer for 31 years. And it's funny. When I went into business with Greg, I actually had no idea. <laughs> Normally, uh, cops give off cop vibes, but strangely, Greg did not give off a cop vibe. Or maybe I'm just bad at reading it, but uh, I had no clue you were a cop. I always thought you were just running that Stone Deck company. Mm -hmm. um, so then when you were like, yeah, I, was, uh, I, I just retired. I was like from what? And you're yeah. like policing. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's funny that you say that because there, yeah. there are people that I've met who have said, uh, I could tell you're a cop right away. And there are others that had uh, no idea. I mean, I, I, I personally don't uh, advertise that. I sure. mean, it's, it's one of these things where, um, uh, you know, there, there are people out there who may not appreciate uh, a cop. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to deal with that. The other, and, and another reason is, is you know, uh, it's you know, you tell somebody you're a cop. The number one question: Have you ever shot anyone? Have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and you know what? I thank God I I, I, no, I finished I my career and and never had to uh, pull the trigger, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so it's yeah. just like people once I I, I tend to be you know. Uh, as I say is, uh, you know, I don't need many friends. I just need uh, a small group of good friends, right? And yep. not one person to uh, really run around and, and... I'm not somebody that, you know, is like, you know, <clears throat> what's the word? I wanna, I wanna word this properly. I know cops. I have cops that I like. I also know of some cops that I do not like, um, just personality-wise, right? Um, they're human beings like anything else. And I'm definitely not somebody that's like, Oh, you're a cop. That's so awesome. Thin blue line, you know, blah, blah. blah. I, I'm not that guy. I, you know, but obviously as a person, I liked you and I got along with you regard before I even knew you were a cop. So just knowing you're a cop, I just thought it was interesting because like most people, when you get to like know them a little bit, you like, you know, you kind of know what they do, but I, somehow I just never picked up on that. And it's probably my fault. I didn't ask really. <laughs> I'm bad for not asking, you know, but, um, I just thought it was interesting. I, I look at it more as, you know, you've obviously seen some things. You've gone through some interesting things. And it also explains some stuff about your personality. You're like, I'm more of like kind of like a spontaneous, let's just do it. And you're, uh, you're more like organizational, boom, 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 this, 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 which I appreciate. It's always good to have like a voice like that. Yeah. And, and then knowing your background, it explains yeah. it. Um, as a cop, I guess you can just... You don't have to talk about your whole career. Obviously, it's a 31-year career. That's, that's one hell of a career. 31 years of doing anything is impressive, um, but especially that job. Uh, what were some of the roles that you held? Uh, well, I started out like uh, any police officer would here in <clears throat> Ontario or Canada. I started off in uh, general patrol as a patrol officer. Um, spend the majority of my career there. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I joined uh, our emergency services unit uh, in Ottawa. What is that? Um, it is a, re a response unit that deals with um, search and rescue, um, uh, missing persons, public order, uh, higher end events. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I ended up being on uh, well, the, the training coordinator for that unit. Okay. And uh, from there, I went to our training branch and spent a number of years in the training branch, having the opportunity to train uh, new officers coming on the job, as well as certifying current officers. Ended up getting promoted from there uh, to the rank of sergeant and then finished my career basically 12 years as a, a sergeant, a road boss uh, with the auto police and in my mind the best job ever because I, you know, I got to go to all the good calls I wanted to and I didn't get saddled with all the paperwork, right? Nice. So it's like when they say, I want to speak to your supervisor, exactly. you're the guy that showed yeah, up. Exactly. You're the supervisor. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, one of the... the yeah, 
you know, people ask me, like, you know, from your career after 31 years, what's one of the most memorable things? I mean, when I look back at my career, and especially the timing of it, the level of technology that's changed, and it's changed how policing. So when I started, like, I remember, and, and maybe you don't even know what some of these things are, but uh, we used to have to fight to find carbon paper when we write oh, I remember reports, carbon paper right? yeah the yellow paper so, uh, no it was black it was a was black, it black? Uh, black paper that you'd put between, oh, between the, yes. the reports right yeah, yeah, yeah. so when your carbon paper would run out you'd have to scramble to find another one because all the reports were ha handwritten right? handwritten you would have to uh, type on a manual typewriter uh, you know doing things uh, you know liquid paper um, having uh, uh, like the criminal code and your Highway Traffic Act, if you didn't know anything, you had to actually grab a book and flip through it and find the section and everything else. And I look at the, the officers that are coming on now and, you know, having the opportunity to, to watch some of these officers, you know, Siri, what's the uh, uh, Highway Traffic Act code for this? And it pops up on their phone, right? So uh -huh. you, just that level of, of, of training and then obviously um, with the, the amount of social media and cameras you know in, in recent years like you're not going to do anything in policing or any real emergency service without having you know half a dozen uh, phones or cameras filming what's what's going on right yeah and that definitely changes the the vibe for sure when you always know it's like there's like 10 different people watching you and and uh, some of them aren't super friendly towards you and they're going to be looking to catch things in a bad light if they can catch them. Yeah, I would like to think, uh, I mean, uh, the majority of officers that I've had the opportunity to work with have all been professional. And I mean, you're going to act and you're going to do uh, what you're going to do, whether there's a camera there or not. I mean, sure. as a supervisor, we'd have somebody that would complain this officer swore. I mean, my response to that would be, so what? Like yeah. people swear <laughs> in the heat of the moment, right? Sure. As long as that is say within appropriate context, right? Yeah. Not racially motivated, not inappropriate at the time. For I sure. mean, that, that's being human, right? Yeah. And I mean, when cameras showed up, I mean, cameras were there. To me, it's like, that's even more validation for me because we don't have body cameras like Ottawa at, at, at right now um, does not have our own video evidence of the transaction that's going to occur but the the only issue with that is like you know there'll, there'll be that sh small snippet that will that's just right. be cut and pasted a certain way that you okay. know you then have to articulate when you post a video without context you can make someone look a very certain way yep. if you don't see the whole unedited interaction. So yeah. whenever you see edited video of anything, whether it's dog training, whether it's uh, an interaction between a cop and somebody, I always want to see the whole thing. If I didn't see the before and the after, then I didn't see, I don't, I don't care what I think I saw, I, I don't know until I see it. So, yeah. so that's interesting. You were, uh, you know, that, that's, that's certainly, it's funny because um, there's a lot of cops that get into dog training. I guess it's one of those kind of almost adjacent, uh, adjacent uh, professions because there's a lot of cops that, you know, at one time are a cop, or they're even still a cop and they, they get involved in the dog training thing. Yeah. So I guess it called to you to some degree. I don't know if it's, you know, the policing side of it or the fact that I just always liked dogs. I liked having, uh, you know, uh, a well-behaved dog that I could bring anywhere right i mean yep. the, the more training you put on a dog the more freedom that dog is going to have right 100 percent. so um and then again our experiences with halo and you know coming to retirement and then having these opportunities i think that always that kind of brought things to to, to bear um you know as a, you know to your point as a police officer a type personality i am 100 percent yep. uh, anal i am i see things black and white i mean i guess the the my Negative thing is I don't see gray too often, right? And, and that's that's what I for dogs. Right that's for. <laughs> very dogs hate gray. Dogs love black and white. Yeah. So that approach is if you're a dog trainer, oper, do not operate in shades of gray. Dogs do not do well in that uncertain place. They do well with certain outcomes. This is yeah. good. This is bad. And I think a lot of people that struggle with their dog's behavior or struggle to train dogs, they have way too much gray in what they're doing. Yeah. So. I think that's that's certainly a benefit. If there's one moment in your career that stands out to you, one interaction, 
one thing that happened, one good thing, one bad thing, what is it? There's actually two, and there's, there's, there's two things in my career that really, really uh, resonated and will always resonate with me. Um, uh, September 11th. Oh. So um, we were working uh, with the emergency service unit downtown uh, for, a, uh, for a big event. Um, I remember being there with my partner, uh, or sitting in our car, listening to the radio or whatever, and the news came on in terms of uh, aircraft uh, hitting the Twin Towers and then the other aircraft hitting the Twin Towers. And things started to come in terms of the information, and a lot of the information was wrong. And then I remember us being ordered, and, and like, I'll never forget this, is like uh, all, uh, you know, uh, available officers are to report to downtown and evacuate the downtown. Like, what does that mean? Evacuate the downtown? Evacuate the downtown. Like the city? In the, in the city, because there was information that a plane is, was heading or could be heading towards Parliament Hill. Oh. And we literally, like, started on Wellington Street pushing people as everybody was, like, the, and the information was coming out and the networks were getting flooded and uh, cell phone reception was going down. Everybody was coming out of the office towers. And we started, for those of you that don't know Wellington, it's the north end of Ottawa. The Parliament Hill sits against the, the Ottawa River. Then you have Wellington Street, which runs east and west. And we literally started on Wellington just pushing everybody as people were coming out. Go, go, leave your car. And, and, and not knowing what was coming. Right? And of course, it was all misinformation at that point in terms of nothing was heading to Canada. Flights sure. are getting grounded and everything yeah. else. But it was just one of these things like evacuate the downtown. Like, what How do you that? even do that? Well, and that's the thing. Like, no, <laughs> no one kind of knew, right? And it was just like, and you know, funny story. I remember this, this, this chip wagon being all set up there downtown. We're like, you got to go. And he's like, I got my fryers going. I got, I got the my fryers, fryers going. And everything else and, and having to do that, right? So, and, and, and obviously as the day unfolded and, and you realize, you know, what that day was, it, it's just one of those events that really, really uh, stands out for me. How many people are in the downtown of Ottawa? Oh, I, I mean, during the day, like, and again, this is pre-COVID when all the office towers were, were filled with people. I mean, you know, easily you're talking 100,000 people, right? Like, yeah, in the downtown that's impossible. Core. Well, it yeah, was, yeah. right? It was. Right? Like, but, I mean, you're dealing with something that's not uh, known, right? Yeah. And then the other uh, event that really, really uh, resonates with me is, and again, we were working, I was working uh, day shift that time, is when uh, Corporal Nason uh, Cirillo was shot and killed. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so he's from Hamilton, his family and everything else. Yes. Um, and the information that day, again, it was, um, you know, it, it just went crazy. Um, you know, so the, the, the suspect who shot Cirillo and then jumped in a car and then drove to Parliament Hill and then attacked uh, the Parliament and was, uh, was shot and killed by the RCMP uh, yeah. in Parliament. Um, Wasn't he killed by the sergeant at he, arms? He, wa he, he was. I mean, so the, he gets all the credit uh, for it. Yeah. Right? But uh, I think there was a lot... Um, let's just say the, the cart left the barn, or the horse left the barn there, uh, that they couldn't spin the story back. I think more credit needs to be uh, given to the RCMP okay. than, than was given, given to him, right? But okay. anyway, we'll leave that as is. But um, again, it was one of these days where, you know, um, as the information came in, it started just getting crazier and crazier because the response was everybody. And, and when, I, when I say everybody, you're talking about a special like JTF2 mm -hmm. getting spun up mm -hmm. because of the parliament, RCMP, OPP, Ottawa police, information coming in where there's somebody running around with a gun. Um, I hear bangs, I hear this, more shooters. And wow. for the first little while, it was, it was controlled chaos, right? And, and, and I mean, beyond that, I mean, uh, Nathan Cirillo lost his life that day, which was uh, absolutely sad. sad and tragic. And um, uh, it just... Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, I'll just give a brief thing. So I, a lot of our viewers are not in Canada, so okay. they're maybe not so familiar with the Nathan Cirillo incident. Um, we have a, uh, a monument 
we yeah. call it the, the uh, National War Memorial. The National War Memorial. So there's always a soldier. Um, what's the regiment? The Argyles? So they use different regiments, but basically okay. during the, the summer, the warmer months, they'll have uh, different uh, troop members of the regiment uh, standing guard uh, outside the uh, memorial. So informal, uh, informal, not, not in like BDUs, but like informal, informal dr dress uniform. Dress, yeah. Yes, so they're informal dress uniform. They're not actually armed. Um, they're standing outside the war memorial in order to honor the, uh, the fallen soldiers. And uh, that's just something that we do here in Canada. And um, on that specific day, there happened to be an individual that... Uh, Basically drove up, parked his car by the uh, memorial and uh, ran up and uh, shot and killed um, Nathan Cirillo. Yes, and then he went to Parliament Hill. Yeah, which is just around the corner, got in his car, drove away, drove up on Parliament Hill, um, engaged the RCMP on the hill, and then ran into uh, Centre Block, where uh, different members of uh, Parliament were uh, sitting, and uh, he was uh, killed in, in, in Centre Block. That's a, it's, it's an insane story. It's funny, I completely forgot about it until yeah. you brought it up. When was this? Oh, now you're going to test my memory. I mean, you're uh, probably talking uh, 10 years ago. 10 years getting ago. Getting on to that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, now, now it's all coming back. I remember it. It was, it was obviously for us, that's not something that happens so much, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. That's, and I remember, yeah. like, uh, um, the, the, I was on uh, with E Platoon at the time, and we all, because we were one of the, the platoon that was working that day, we all came up for uh, Nathan Surreal's funeral in, in Hamilton. So pay yeah. our respects to him and his family. Yeah, that was, that's tough stuff. I think he had a young child. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. So, so that, those are certainly two memorable incidents. Yeah. Certainly two memorable incidents. Some heavy stuff. Yeah. So we should probably talk about dog training again. <laughs> I can tell you a lighter story about policing. That tell me a lighter story. story. Yes. Yeah. So this is, going, this is going way back, and this is probably one of my favorite funny uh, stories is... Um, uh, I, was, I was with London police at the time, and I was in a, a two-person uh, car with my partner, and we were working the south end of London, and a uh, call comes in about uh, a, a, a cow loose on the road on Wellington Street south of the 401. So we respond to that. I mean, like, no nothing call. There's a cow. I'll stop yeah. traffic, shoo the cow off the road or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It turns out it wasn't a cow, but it was a, a very large bull. Oh, so oh. I, I was I was the passenger and my partner was driving at the time. And uh, of course, I'm a city guy and my partner's a city guy and don't really know anything about bulls. Or, but we get the idea that we'll just take this cruiser and we'll nudge this bull <laughs> off the side of the road, gently yeah. persuade it. Yeah. So we're, we start driving beside this bull and um, it speeds up. We're speeding up. And at one point, like I'm sitting in the passenger seat and I'm looking out the window and uh, like this nose of this bull is just there running beside this car and it's got the big horns. And uh, like, I'm starting to creep over on my partner's <laughs> lap, like going, this bull is going to go through this window. Like, what are we trying to do here? Yeah, yeah. And then at one point the bull had enough of us and uh, put its head down, ripped the front quarter panel off the car and put us in the dish. Oof. <laughs> and then yeah. went into the field. <laughs> so you achieved your, uh, your goal. Yes, yes. Uh, or it achieved its goal. So that, I still, um, I still think about that story and it just, just makes me laugh. Oh, uh, that's of, funny. Yeah. So. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, you're, uh, as you mentioned, going through our trainer's course. And I think that's very admirable because obviously, you know, you're not planning on, on training dogs in Shilkina and Ottawa day to day. But you are our first official student in the pro trainer certification program. It's funny you insisted. You're like, I want to be number one. Like, I, want, I want to have the, the number one certificate. I want zero, zero, one. Zero, zero, one. So, so. Greg is going to be number one. Um, I'm not letting anybody else take that number one. In fact, I haven't even let anybody else in it. You're, you're the first one in it. And um, you're, you're pretty close to being done with your dog. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I would have been done. I mean, uh, like, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll get into the details of your course, uh, you know, how it's, it is, but basically you're following the uh, elite uh, off-leash um, course that you have online currently, which is about yep. a six-week course. So um, we've gotten to about four weeks, and then I just had to really shift my focus in regards to uh, 
uh, the kennel and shield canine. Sure. Um, so I've been kind of just doing the maintenance, but I mean, Billy, th that's the dog that I'm training. It's a neighbor's uh, uh, puppy that I took in, uh, is pretty well where I would like him to be. The only thing that I think is, is still missing is just proofing in terms of bringing him into uh, public or high uh, yeah. active areas. And I just actually just haven't had time to do that. So yeah. now that- You gotta, you gotta, you gotta do really well, Greg. I'll fail you in a heartbeat. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, one thing for us, like with the certification, everybody, everybody and his brothers got a certification. Our certification is gonna be meaningful because it's, it's going to actually be tied to video evidence of your ability to train a dog. So. Um, for those of you wondering how it's going to work, you'll see more as time goes on. I'm not going to talk too much about it right now, but Greg is student, or you could say test subject, zero, zero, one. What do, so. what do they call that for like a, a plague or something? Ground zero? Ground, or, yes, or, or patient, or, zero. Or patient zero. <laughs> patient zero. So we're going to see how it, uh, how it goes with him, but uh, stay tuned. I, once, once he submits his test video, I'll just put it up on the YouTube channel. That's the plan. Everybody that uh, tests for Pro Trainer, the Pro Trainer certification, their video is going up on the YouTube channel. We're just going to make it public. People can see um, what someone that we would certify can do. And if they can't do it, yeah. then uh, they're not going to they're not going to certify. And it's just that simple. But I think you will. I've been watching. Greg's been sending me videos of him and the dog, and and it's looking it's looking pretty good. You know, you, you've already kind of got an idea with Halo. Even though you didn't train him, you have to maintain him. Yeah. So I think it actually kind of helps when you're training dogs to kind of have an idea. Like I feel like a lot of people, and this is a big problem in dog training. What is dog training? Like when I say, okay, I train dogs, what? You train dogs to do what? Train dogs to like, I offer dog training for what? You know, and I think there's a lot of like, the, the public in general does not have an idea of what dog training is or should be. A lot of them have this idea, it's like, I take my puppy, if I have a puppy, I, go to, go to, I gotta go to puppy classes. So I go to the puppy classes, I show up for however many weeks that is, I pay my money, um, you know, maybe I feed my puppy some treats and lure him into some different behaviors, I get my certificate and I'm done. And it's like, that is not dog training. <laughs> But most people think that's what dog training is. And then maybe some people are more committed and they keep going to their local trainer and get as many, they, they get like, you know, grade, oh, my dog finished grade three. What's grade three? Well, you know, he can sit for hot dogs in the room and he can do a recall on a long line and, okay, like, can he do it right here, right now? Can he do it in public? No? Well, no. okay. I mean, I'm sure you did something, but you haven't really done much. And I think what we did and we were like the first in terms of like in this general area. What we did was we said, dog training is not just about showing up and getting certificates. We, we of course, we give the people that pass our uh, training now a certificate for sure. Your dog though is your certificate. If you can't, you know, walk your dog around off leash, if you can't take your dog off leash, make a recall. If you don't have, if your dog isn't free, if your dog isn't, you know, a compliment as you mentioned already to your life, what, who cares how many grades yep. you earned at the local dog training school? It's, you, your dog doesn't reflect that. It, I mean, it, it blows my mind, like, just watching. Think it's normal to be dragged down the street by their dog. Yes. Like, not only is that not normal, how is that enjoyable? Like, I enjoy walking my dog because sure. I'm going for a walk. Yeah. He's out there. He's sniffing. He's having a good time. I'm out there enjoying the outside. Mm-hmm. I'm not being pulled around. <laughs> oh, there's something worse than just this, this feeling of being dragged. It, but it, yeah. it's almost like people are like, that, that's normal behavior for owning a dog, which yes. it's not. Yeah, well, I've seen, we've seen the leash, the well, leash I, that, that you that's attach. That's my favorite, especially in the yeah. wintertime on ice when you oh. go down and the dog keeps going. Yeah, you just slide right along behind them. It's like being pulled by a sled dog. Yeah, it's a, it's a lifestyle. You know, the, the, the biggest challenge that I had, and I still would say that we have it, is showing people what's possible. People don't perceive it. Yeah. People have no idea what is possible. I mean, obviously, if you watch our YouTube channel, like you watched our my trip to Banff, for instance, and you saw, okay, like this is what this guy's doing with his dogs. But there are so many clients that we work with that had zero idea that they could have a full off-leash trained dog and what that actually meant. Like not like off-leash trained in the field by himself, but like. No, you can walk your dog down city streets right next yep. to you and have your dog under heavy distraction, fully under control. You can take your dog on a hike and not worry. 
you know, like, and just literally drink coffee and text on your phone while your dog's with you. And it's not a problem, but people just didn't have that. They didn't have, they don't have that idea that that's possible because they have such a limited understanding of what real dog training is. Yeah. And also, you know, I think it's important that people, again, have to understand that they have to put the work in, right? Oh, for it, sure. it, it, it's, one, it's one thing to say, here's the money. I'm going to give you my dog for six-week board and train, and he will do everything that we are going to tell you he will do. But if you don't keep that up, mm -hmm. if all of a sudden your sit doesn't mean sit, if your come doesn't mean come, very quickly, especially if it's, uh, you know, uh, a, a working breed dog or a dog with a stronger personality, they're going to test and they're going to be like, screw you. <laughs> Every, everyone's always like, well, I want my dog to just do it. You know, like, for instance, we train with the e-collar a lot, right? I don't want my dog to need that collar. Well, he doesn't need the collar. But if you want him to be reliably obedient um, and you want to be able to trust him under high levels of distraction and know without a shadow of a doubt that everything's going to be okay, uh, you better be willing to use some level of reinforcement, both positive and negative, to hold him accountable. This idea that a dog, just out of the goodness of his heart, is going to listen, that doesn't even work for humans. No, we I mean, all know what the law is. We still, there's a reason we need police, yeah. right? We all know what the law is, and we're cerebral beings. We're beings capable of higher level, you know, we have a higher level intellect, higher levels of communication, and yet we still need enforcers to make sure that we all continue to function as a civilized society, because regardless of the law, Human beings, just like animals, are going to look for their own advantage. And if their own advantage does not coincide with the rules, with the law, with what's right, per se, they're going to go and engage in behaviors that are dangerous or harmful to others. A hundred percent. I mean, and to your point in regards to the e-caller, like to me, it's insurance. Um, I mean, there are quite a few times, like, I will walk Halo and I put his e-collar on and I've forgotten to turn it on. Oh, all the right? time. Right? <laughs> but he's got his e-collar on hmm. just in case, hopefully it's on, yeah. just in case that one day that squirrel or something is a bit more of a drive for him than me saying, get over here, right? I mean, again, it's like wearing your seatbelt. I've never gotten into an accident. Why do you keep putting your seatbelt on? Just in just case. Just in case. Right? Just in case. Yeah, I think a lot of people really struggle with that. Like, there's this weird, like, idea that, like, Dogs should just do things out of the goodness of their... Well, my dog does things for hot dogs. I've never needed... Everyone's like, oh, I've never needed that. And then I'm always like, show me. Because there's always people with... I've never knew... I have this dog. He's so good. Show me. Mm -hmm. And there is no one that can really show you. When you say, okay, just walk your dog. Okay, there's a city street. There's like, I don't know, about a few hundred people walking back and forth. There's some traffic. There's that guy with that barking little dog. And there's some pigeons over there. Off leash. Let's go. Go, make some obedience. Just walk, just walk. No, don't be like, yeah, with me, with me. No food luring, no, not. Just walk, just walk with your dog. Let me see. Oh, I can't. Oh, it's illegal. Oh, the, yeah. the, then the excuses come because it's like, no, you actually don't have that level. You think you might have that level because your dog kind of maybe sort of listens, you know, with, with enough positive reinforcement and so on and so forth. But that's not what we're after. We're after a level of reliability that most people don't perceive as possible until they actually see it. So when you, based on your experience with dog training, when do you think the kind of shift towards and who do you think was the person mainly behind it or if there is a such person? Because when I look back at training, you know, now going back, you know, almost, geez, 30 years, yeah. right? My first shepherds or whatever, it was all about... Um, positive reinforcement there was no 30 old. years um yeah it's funny because I, I i think i always think of the positive reinforcement movement as being more like 20 years old no so so um where like when i was first training my dog it was all about leash pressure there was no show your dog what to do have your dog understand it, and then put no the you mean on. negative reinforcement not positive yes reinforcement. sorry it was all pop, 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 exactly. yank and crank. We yes. call it yank and crank. Exactly. You got to exactly, do it. right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there was none of... Uh, Greg, you know there's a theoretical portion to the uh, testing for a pro trainer. I am going to have it written down on my hand, ready to go. <laughs> there's gonna, there's gonna, you're going to have to give me a practical example. Now okay. I know for you yes, what, what I'm going to be putting in the questions. The four quadrants? No. <laughs> it, it ain't going to be, it's going to be a practical example. Yeah. You're going to have to, um, yeah. But yeah, so yeah. like, I, you know, it, it's, it's when I started really looking into training 
of recent years, it's yeah. like I found myself going, I got to go back and apologize to all these dogs because it's just like, I want you to sit and I'm going to basically yeah. choke you till you sit without yep. showing you what a sit is. Yep. yep. So when, when do you think that, ch that change? Well, okay. So like I would say in like the mid to late nineties, positive reinforcement training really took over. Um, in terms of that becoming the, the more prevalent form of dog training that was like, you know, uh, this was like the new thing. It was going to change everything, right? Because we found that, you know, uh, there's a number of individuals that take credit for like the advent of positive reinforcement training. As with anything, I'm sure it's, it, it's certainly more than one person. Um, you know, for clicker training, uh, there's a lady called Karen Pryor that really... Uh, takes a lot of credit for clicker training, but then there's a trainer called Gary Wilkes who takes, who, who's actually like, no, actually I was the first clicker trainer. She learned from me. So, you know, there's some disagreements about that. I don't really know. But uh, in terms of uh, positive reinforcement training, what people found was you don't, you don't have to have a miserable dog because with Yank and Crank, unless you have a very resilient dog, um, they tend to look a little bit down in the dumps. They'll do it. They'll do it. That training works, you know, but they will often not look particularly happy. And um, I think as more women became involved in dog training, the, uh, the, the dog's emotional um, well-being or perceived emotional well-being became very important. And uh, I think that's really what, what really drove it. And um, the clicker training, positive reinforcement training is something actually that comes from marine mammals. Right, because there's so you need to get the dolphins to jump through the hoop to entertain the people at the aquarium, so that you can keep paying the bills. Right, so there was a lot of this type of stuff, and then you can go all the way back to B. F. Skinner, and I'm sure there's a lot of places that it actually came from. But it comes from this idea that animal, uh, a dog will learn much more quickly and effectively with the use of positive reinforcement than any other form of learning. And that the dog not only will learn more quickly and effectively, but will also be in a more positive state of mind. Um, now, of course, the reality is that that is absolutely 100% true, but it's missing something. Because the assumption with positive reinforcement training is that the dog will always want to do what you want him or her to do. Um, when in reality, the dog has his or her own mind. And what's positive for your dog may not coincide with what's positive for you. So a simple example would be you have a liver treat in your hand, okay? And I want you to stay with me. I've got this liver treat, and I'm going to feed you this liver treat every so often if you stay with me. But the dog's like, okay, yeah, I like the liver treat. It's good. I'll, I'll, I'll take your liver treat. But then there's a bunny over there. I want the bunny more than I want your liver treat. There's another dog over there. I'd like to meet that dog more than I need your liver treat. And now we run into a system of competing motivators. You know, well, then they'll say, well, just improve your motivation, get something more. The reality is for a lot of dogs, you're not going to be able to outcompete the world. The world has a lot of things in there that are attractive to a lot of different dogs. For sure, there's some dogs that have such a naturally high desire to work for that liver treat and such a high level of biddability that it is hard to outcompete that. But the vast majority of normal dogs that people own are not, are getting you know, there's, there's certainly much more motivated by competing motivators in the world than they are, you know, by whatever the handler has, which is what creates a lack of reliability. It's like, yeah, he understands. He understands all the commands that you've asked him or her to do. He's learned them all positively. He has a positive association with doing all of those things. But he also has a positive association with chasing squirrels. And he has a positive association with jumping on strangers. And he has a positive association with meeting strange people. The mistake that modern... I, and, Here's another thing that bothers me. The positive only trainers claiming that their way is the modern way. It's not the modern way. The modern way is actually what we're doing now, where you meld the old way and the new way, and you come up with something that's better. A balanced right? form of training. A balanced form of training, right? We went from one extreme to the other. No reward. He just has to do it all the time. And then only reward. There's no form of obligation whatsoever. It's completely up to him. We meld them together, and lo and behold, we have the best form of training available um, since we've had dogs in our lives for the last, I don't know, five, ten thousand 10,000 years, however long it's been. Yeah. So I think um, the, uh, it's kind of gone both ways. The pendulum, one way, 
now the pendulum, uh, the pendulum, I would say from mid 90s to about uh, 20, I would say 2018, 20, 2016 to 2018, super positive only. And now you see that the pendulum is swinging back to the middle where a lot of people, here's the thing, as social media got more popular, people started to see the truth. The positive only training crowd really relied on talking. Like this, no, trust me, this is, look at all my accreditations, look at all my certifications, look at all my degrees. Um, oh, I help this dog do this, I help that dog do that. Well, now we all have these wonderful video cameras with us at all times. And what happened was the balance trainers started filming what they did. And the positive only trainers filmed, but there's not a lot for them to film other than them kind of giving dogs you know, treats in isolated environments, whereas the balance trainers are at the local Home Depot with the dog off leash next to them. And, in a, and then the, 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 the balance trainers started showing behavioral training where it's like, yeah, look, he's nasty. Now he's not like your dog Halo, right? And people started to be like, the proof is like there. And if you present proof long enough, of course, you're going to see it. So I, I told you at the Pet Expo, right? Like you used to go to Pet Expos, you wouldn't see a single training tool on a dog. Like it would just be all harnesses and flat collars. Now you go to a pet expo, everybody's got a prong collar and an e-collar and this collar and that. Like everybody's using tools in dog training, whereas these tools before, like you would never really see them in the general public. If I would drive through a suburban neighborhood, I'll see someone with an e-collar. I'll see someone with a prong collar. Now don't get me wrong. A lot of the people are using these tools ineffectively. They're not using them properly, but they are using them, which means that the pendulum is swinging. If I'm seeing it, as much as I'm seeing it, like a lot of the dogs that walk through our doors have already been on tools, right? They've been using a collar, an e-collar, a prong collar, whatever. And again, the mistake a lot of people make is assuming that the tool trains the dog. Um, these people find out very quickly the tool does not train the dog. The training trains the dog. The tools simply enhance your ability as a trainer. So, you know, I think dog training kind of was this, then it went this, and now it's coming back to here. The positive only crowd are really fighting with legislation to try and push it back here because, and they're succeeding in Europe, places like Europe, you know, where they're just banning literally any form of aversives in dog training. And uh, aversives are necessary in any kind of training, whether you're training an animal or a human being, um, but that's another conversation. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, when I first started training dogs, I said to you before, I'll say it again, when I first started training dogs professionally and offering it as a service, selling basically a lifestyle with your dog that, no, it's like, I'm not just selling dog training, you show up, you get your certificate, you leave. No, I'm selling you a lifestyle. Like, this is what living with your dog can be. Um, there was really nobody in the area doing it. Like, there was people that had, like, you know, you're, we had the cookie trainers, but we didn't have, like, someone selling a lifestyle and really selling concrete behavioral training, you know, that we sell now. Now... You see a lot of people offering it. Now, how many people can deliver it is another question altogether. But there, it's now something that's being sold a lot more. So it's interesting watching the industry move. And of course, you know, hard to say what the future brings. It really depends a lot on the government. Depends on, I think if everything's left organically, balanced training is already kind of taking off, right? Because people, there's a huge hunger And it for makes that. sense and it works. It makes sense. Most logical individuals, when you stop and think about it for five minutes, you're like, yeah, that does make sense. You know, emotional people buy the positive only training because it's from an emotional perspective, it's very appealing. Oh, like my dog's going to love me and, and I just give him cookies all the time and he's going to be fully trained and I get my certificate and we're going to call it a day. And it's like, you know, if you're, if you're thinking emotionally, that, that is an appealing thing. So right. I think the, the, the gap that a lot of balanced trainers, including us, because we're in the balanced training business, have to bridge is, no, that's not actually the best thing for the dog. The best thing for the dog is a balanced training approach, just as the best thing for you as a human being or your children is a balanced approach, right? There's good and there's bad. Here's how we go to the good, here's how we go to the bad. And some of your behavioral predispositions are not good. This idea that the dog's always going to choose good behavior, even if you show them good behavior, it's, it works the same as your kids. You can show your kids as many times good behavior as you like. They're still sometimes going to choose bad behavior. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So it's a, I think balanced training in general, what we need to do is we need to not just say that this is dog training. This is a lifestyle. This is a lifestyle for you and your dog that is the most healthy lifestyle for you and your dog.
you know, some sugar and some exercise. Yep. You know. I don't know, Greg. Any thoughts on just in general? I don't know. I think we've covered a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like you're winding down a little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, at this, what's up, Tammy? Jesus Christ. I know. Do you even, like, know I do have, have them. Calls? I do have them. Hold on. Let's just pause this. No, Dave, don't call me right now. Yes. Hold on. I'm going to send Evo's x-rays right now. In the meantime, if you think of something to add, just... No pressure. Fuck. Did you end up getting uh, the vet records for Chico too? No? no, I don't have them yet. I just need a referral for Chico. I don't need vaccines. Photos. X. Back. Where are they? Who's this? This is not Chico. I was supposed to send these x-rays. I said I would do it, and then I completely forgot, as per always. You need an assistant. I do, but I'm not making enough money yet to have one. I've told my wife I'm going to get a pretty assistant. I'm sure that went over well. It went as well as you would imagine it would go. <laughs> she did not like it. That's, that's when you play both sides and you get a hot guy as an assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Don't put that on the mic. <laughs> it's all recording, baby. It's all recording. So Greg wants a hot guy as an assistant. Check. Check. Come on, you. Oh, I know where I sent I sent them to Mike when I sent that dog to the coppers. Messenger. Mike. So where are you flying to? Mexico. Oh, nice. Where part? <laughs> oh, no? He doesn't even know where he's going. I don't even know where I'm going. You're just going to go? Yeah. Whatever happens, happens. I haven't booked anything. I don't even know where I'm staying or when the flight is. Or... How have you not booked anything? <laughs> Someone else booked it. Okay. I kind of, uh, it was, it's my buddy's older brother. Okay. He's got a twin brother. And his twin brother broke up with his girlfriend. So they had this extra ticket. And they were like, you want to go? Hell yeah. All right. <laughs> Sucks for her. Good for you. As long as they put your name on the ticket, right? Because if you get to the airport and it's still her name, you're going to be standing there with bags in hand going, bye. <laughs> All right. Poor Jessica. Okay. Photos. Here we are, baby. Boom. Boom. Yep. Yeah. Boom, boom. So that's on the Caribbean side, so Good. very crystal clear water, okay. temperatures, everything else. So. Is there anything I should have mentioned that I'm forgetting to mention? We'll, uh, we'll put, we'll put uh, all Greg's information in the description. Oh, eh? Uh, yes. Do you have video of you walking Halo off leash? Uh, yes, I do. Can you give it to him? Yeah. Yeah, just like brief, like when he's talking about it, just yeah. flash that, flash that up there. You want to run the outro now? Huh? Right now? Yeah, I think we'll jump to the outro. I think we're, uh, I'll wrap, we'll wrap it up, unless there's something else you got. Uh, no, I mean, uh, we've talked about uh, the facility and the expansion, and it was mm -hmm. a good conversation. So. Okay. Are we still good, Dan? All right. Okay, guys, so we've been talking for a while with Greg. I know Greg's tired of talking. He's not much of a talker. <laughs> Getting information out of Greg's like pulling blood from a stone. Come on. <laughs> but um, anyways, what we're going to be... Uh, anyways, we're going to wrap it up. Um, Greg, when are you getting involved in dog sport? <laughs> 
Well, as soon as my uh, schedule clears up. Right now, I'm a little bit busy with uh, Shield K9 Ottawa spinning up and getting mm -hmm. it to where we need it to be to meet your high standards. Uh -huh. uh, spinning up Beds for Tails uh, kennels. And then uh, once that's done and, uh, you know, a couple of big projects in the pool, dock diving pool for Shield K9. Oh, snap. Uh, coming. Dock diving. Uh, that's right. Shield K9's going dock diving, that's baby. Right. That's going to be the next big uh, thing. We're going to be uh, the premier uh, destination for, for your dog, from training to swimming to dock diving to everything else. So once that's all done and everything is uh, running without uh, any issues, and, uh, and then we might look at, into that. So I'll have to keep an eye on your breeding program, to see if you've got a dog that might uh, fit the needs. Uh, I like Chico a lot. I think he's, <laughs> I think he's actually going to produce a lot of really nice sport dogs, police dogs, protection dogs. He's a, he's a super dog. Yeah. Very excited to have him as a part of my program. And um, I think you're going to love IGP. You've got the personality for it. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't be PSA. No, no, no. Yeah, no. So uh, once we get Greg hooked on IGP, it'll be uh, it'll be good. And I know what's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Time, eh? Then okay. we'll, you won't need to do vacations with your wife anymore, <laughs> anything like that. It, you'll have already things to do. All right. Yeah. So good news for her. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. So we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, Greg's information. Well, Greg's information. Shield K9 Ottawa, the website is live you guys can check it out in the description below so if you're in ottawa or any of the surrounding areas we have training available for you we have services we have gear we have swag available for you um, all our information here for shield k9 is going to be available uh, check out our patreon if you haven't checked it out yet raw training footage unedited all the uh the behind the scenes stuff going on on our patreon and if you want step-by-step -step instruction and you can't get to a shield k9 or you don't want to get to a shield k9 which is completely fine we have online courses which go through step-by-step -step instructions whether you have a new puppy a dog with behavioral problems like halo sport dog whether you want to do protection training so on and so forth it's all available for you there thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one What do you mean? Like uh, the podcast, but I'm not, we'll be posting it early on Patreon. Uh, oh, okay. So, so guys, we now have a Patreon where we are. Let me think about it. Okay, guys. So we now have a Patreon. The reason I started Patreon is I wanted a place that I could put raw, unedited training footage, stuff that I can't put on YouTube, and stuff that doesn't quite fit in my online courses, which is more kind of sequential how tos. My Patreon is how to but it's a lot of just raw, unedited stuff, uh, all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes, um, videos that I film all the time here, training my own personal dogs and clients' dogs. If you wanna check that out, it's gonna be in the description below. All things like this podcast that we just filmed, uh, all my YouTube videos are gonna be posted early on Patreon for members. And uh, again, just tons of really cool content that you're not gonna find anywhere else available on my Patreon, only $9.99 per month. There's too much shit, man. Like, it's, it's all good. We got it all. <laughs>